Hello, and welcome to Kitchen Table Theology. I'm your host, Tiffany Coker, and with Pastor Jeff Cranston, we're on a quest to learn what the Bible teaches about theological topics that many Christians find challenging, confusing, and out of their reach. And we're always aiming to do this in a way that applies to the lives we lead. We want to help you be strong in your faith doctrinally, knowledgeable in and of the Word theologically, and grow in your love for Jesus and others exponentially. Before we dive into today's podcast episode, we want to thank you, our listeners, for leaving us ratings and reviews. We are grateful for each one because that is what helps us get the word out to more and more people about Kitchen Table Theology. We're also very grateful for our friends at Columbia International University. For 100 years now, CIU has educated people from a biblical worldview to impact the nations with the message of Christ. They offer undergraduate, graduate, and seminary programs both on campus and via online programs designed for working adults. You can check all that out and more at ciu.edu. Today, we are continuing our overview of the Bible with a look at the New Testament letter known as the Epistle of Paul to the Romans. We do want to apologize before we get started. We had some technical difficulties this week, and the audio is not the best quality. We're working to correct this for next week, but we really appreciate your patience and understanding. Our friends at Streamline Podcast have worked a little bit of their magic to make it as good as they could, and for that, we are very grateful. Thanks so much for joining us at the table. Let's get started. Hello again, and welcome back to Kitchen Table Theology. I'm your host, Tiffany Coker, along with my dad, Pastor Jeff Cranston. We're seeking not only to help deep, solid biblical theology, but to know the Word of God and the promises of God that are given to us in His Word, all while holding to solid theological truths in your heart, soul, and mind. I want to take just a second before we get started and thank you, our listeners. We now have over 65,000 downloads on Kitchen Table Theology, which is so exciting, and we really are so grateful for your support. It's exciting for us to see that you guys are digging in and continuing to learn about tough theological concepts and how we can break those down, which is exactly what we're going to do today here on the podcast. We're continuing with a brief overview of the New Testament letter of Paul, known to us as the Epistle of Paul to the Romans. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this, Romans is the greatest masterpiece ever written. It is a colossal and incomparable statement of Christian truth. He believed that so deeply that what he preached close to 400 sermons working his way through the book of Romans. I promise we will not do that with this, these podcast episodes. <laughs> Just in case you've missed it, beginning with episode 143, we have already discussed and studied 13 Old and New Testament books. Only 53 more to go, guys. And we've discussed those books along with their theological theme. So if you've missed any of that, we encourage you to go back, give them a listen. Dad, how are you doing today? You ready to dive into Romans? Ready to dive in and uh, want to say thanks again, Kitchen Table Theologians, for listening. And uh, yeah, 65,000 downloads. We never, <laughs> ever thought we would. Of course, to, to some, they get that in a week. But for us, that's a big deal. And you have helped make <laughs> that a reality. And we're very grateful. And what a task we have before us today as we talk about Romans, this Paul, this letter of Paul's filled with theological themes on pretty much every page, definitely in every chapter. So we're going to do our best to whittle it down for today's podcast and try to see the grandest and loftiest of theological themes. So I can't see a problem there. What could possibly go wrong? Yes. And for those who might not know, you have been preaching through Romans for almost six, I guess, six months now, verse by verse. And your plan is to continue doing this for the remainder of the year at Low Country Community Church. Is that right? That's right. So depending on when you're listening to this, all of 2023, we just decided to spend the year in Romans. It's been exciting. It's been challenging, difficult for sure, enlightening, you name it, and a whole lot more. We're really learning a lot about the Trinity, the Father, Son, the Spirit, and their work in our lives as we work our way through this letter to the Romans. Let's go ahead and get started. I think we can all assume by the title given to the book um, in most of our New Testaments, the Epistle of Paul to the Romans, that we probably don't need to spend too much time on asking the question, who is the author of this letter? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, Paul's most definitely the author, and there has hardly been anyone throughout history who has seriously disputed that he is not the writer. It's the Apostle Paul, for sure. Then perhaps just a little bit of background on the book would be a helpful place for us to start. Yeah, a good idea. Paul's letter to the Romans was written, most say around 56 to 58 AD. So about, what's that, just almost 30 years, a little less than 30 years after the death of Christ. He wrote it from the city of Corinth because he spent three months in Greece, which is where Corinth is located. And that occurred at the end of Paul's third missionary journey, which you read about in Acts 20. Now, Paul at the time was on his way to Jerusalem, but he had future plans to visit Spain. And he spoke of that hope for a trip to Spain uh, three different times. He was really looking forward to traveling to Spain. But alas, as far as we know, he never got there. Maybe he did, but we have no record of Paul ever arriving in Spain. In Romans 15, 20, Paul and Amaze said he wanted to go to Spain because, as far as he knew, the gospel was not yet known there. So he was telling the Romans, on his way to Spain, I'll come visit you all. And a church was already flourishing there, probably formed originally by Jewish Christians who had returned home from Jerusalem after Pentecost. And we read about that in Acts 2. And in Acts 2.10, it's one of those, oh, by the way, portions of Scripture that I always find fascinating. In Acts 2, it's all about the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes down. The apostles begin to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit was giving them utterance. And when people started to hear these apostles speak in their own language, Scripture says they became bewildered because of that thing. and but what they were hearing and the gift the Holy Spirit gave the apostles was they were proclaiming the gospel in languages unknown to them, but understood by the people who spoke those various languages. So then Dr. Luke gives us a list of where these people were from. And in verse 10, we read, there were some, quote, visitors from Rome, end quote. And he goes on to say that the visitors from Rome were both Jews and Gentile converts to Judaism. So a number of those folks apparently came to faith in Christ on that day, and upon their return to their home city of Rome in Italy, they began to establish house churches. So Paul didn't actually plant the church in Rome. He wasn't like the founding apostle, we could say, but he wrote to these believers, knowing of them, to prepare them for the visit he was planning. And he wanted to establish his apostolic credentials within the church, and he takes a lot of chapter one to do that. And he gave them the clearest, most detailed account we possess of the message that Paul actually was preaching. And he calls it the gospel of God. He said, because God's the author of it, he called it the gospel of God's son, because Jesus is the focus. I find it interesting that Paul wrote from Corinth and sent it to Rome. And this was before the post office. How did the letter get there? When you think, if you stop and think about all the ways that the letter could have been lost or destroyed, I really think it is a miracle that the letter made it there at all. Dad, I remember you sent a box of pretty valuable books, I think, to a friend. And still to this day, they have never arrived. We have no idea where they are, despite our best efforts to track them down. No idea where they went. So did the Roman government have a mail system? How did the letter get there? I have so many questions about this. <laughs> yeah, good questions. And I love all that as well. The Romans did have a postal system in the first century, primarily to communicate between government officials and military officials. And its speed of delivery was unmatched until the 19th century. It was called the cursus publicus, which meant public course. So, you know, all roads lead to Rome, and that's because Rome built all the roads pretty much in that day. <laughs> and they used their road system, quite extensive road system, to deliver the mail. And it was like our Pony Express, where riders or runners would take it to a certain station. It would be handed off. Another 
uh, carrier would go and so forth. But so much for the Roman mail system lesson. See, kitchen table theologian, what you learned here today. Come on. This is great. But that has that nothing great. to do with how the letter, the <laughs> Romans got to Rome. So I'm not sure why I went down that rabbit trail. But I, how it got there was a dear sister in the Lord, a woman named Phoebe, carried the letter from Corinth to Rome. Now, don't confuse her with the lovable ditzy Phoebe from the TV show Friends. Let's keep that separate. Our Phoebe traveled a distance of about 650 miles. Now, today you can actually make the journey by car, ferry, train, bus, airplane. You can drive it in about 18 and a half hours on the E55 highway. But back then, no chance of that. Paul mentions her in the first two verses of Romans 16. So, Tiff, how about reading what Paul says of Phoebe? Sure. Okay, here we go. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is at Sancria, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of you. For she herself has also been a helper of many, and of myself as well. I do love the name Phoebe, and this Phoebe must have really been an extraordinary woman. And so I guess we have her to thank for taking such good care of and delivering Paul's letter to the Roman church. We certainly do. But I got to thinking when I was preparing for this podcast, how do we know it was actually her who carried it? Because if it was actually her who carried it, we owe this woman a, a oh, huge wow. debt of gratitude. <laughs> When you think how it could have been lost, destroyed, waylaid, anything, she was, that was an incredible feat back in those days. So here's how I believe we know that Phoebe carried the letter. And most interpreters wi widely agree that it was her. By placing her, so in Romans 16, Paul includes 28 people, I think it's 28, maybe 29, but 28 people that he mentions, gives thanks for, sends greetings from back from them to Rome, so forth. By placing her first, Phoebe first, in that list of those 28 people in Romans 16, by doing that, Paul's introducing her as the bearer yeah. of the letter. And while in our own context, we're grateful for the work of our postal service employees, we do not need to know their background in order to trust that we can accept the mail from them. The fact that Paul spends several sentences to describe Phoebe and uses several emphatic phrases to admonish the Christians in Rome, look, he says, look, treat her well. That, that indicated she was just more than a mail carrier who dropped off the scroll. She will play some role in how they experience the letter, so Paul wants them to trust her. One line of thought popularized by N.T. Wright is that Phoebe, as the letter carrier, would have also read the letter to the churches as well. And Dr. Wright says the letter bearer would normally be the one to read it out to the recipients and explain its context, contents. So pretty incredible woman, pretty incredible way that the letter got from Corinth to Rome. That really is fascinating, but I feel like we maybe have spent way too long on that topic. We need yeah, to probably. get to a few other things. How about giving us a brief overview of the letter of Romans? Romans is a Christian manifesto, I guess you could say. that The contents, much of it was determined by the particular circumstances in which the Apostle Paul and the Roman Christians found themselves. So down through the centuries of the church, it has remained, however, a timeless declaration of freedom through Christ. And it's a message that Paul just keeps driving it home is that human beings are born in sin and slavery, but Jesus Christ came to set us free from all of that. I think that may be a record from you. <laughs> that was definitely a brief overview. So good job. Yeah. I'm being brief. <laughs> Let's move on to some of our theological themes. There's so many in this book. And I know I run into a lot of Christians who feel like Romans is so deep, maybe even too deep for them to understand. And while I don't disagree with that, it definitely is deep. But I think we also need to add the component that it's very rich. It is rich in its theology and its doctrine. It's rich in 
practical ways too and in how to live the Christian life. It's rich in explaining to us in simple terms exactly what Jesus did for us on the cross. Can you maybe give us some of the largest theological themes that we see in Paul's letter? I know this is going to be tough. <laughs> yeah, I'll just do it. Uh, yeah, I'll just say it in two ways. The, there's one theme is justification, and the other theme is redefining who the people of God are. Now, there are many sub-themes from those two, but those are, I think, huge. Mm -hmm. Justification and redefining who the people of God are. So justification is guilty sinners come to faith in Christ. They're de we're declared righteous by God's grace alone and Christ alone through faith alone. That's where the Reformers got it from, by the way. That's, those are three of the five solas of the Reformation. It's the most humbling of all Christian truths, and sal salvation comes from God's grace. It's not our religious works. It's not how we were, what we were born into or any of that. The fact that God makes a way for those of us who are in the wrong with him to be declared in the right by God, that's justification. And that transaction is possible. Paul is adamant about it only through the cross, only through the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins, because he took our place on the cross. Okay, justification is the first of our two major theological themes that you said you see in this book. But surely there has to be many other, maybe smaller themes that have to flow out of that one. Yeah, there's a lot. Just coming out of justification and being declared righteous before God because of the cross, then that brings in salvation. That brings in assurance salvation. Paul touches on that in chapter 5. It brings in spiritual growth and maturity. That's chapter 6. We have to have a good understanding of God's law and how we fail to meet its demands. That's chapter 7. That we can't live this life without the Holy Spirit and His ministry. That's chapter 8. And then in, in chapters 12 to 16, it's all about our responsibilities as followers of Christ. And you can all, I think all of those topics find their root in justification. <laughs> and that's only to name a few. <laughs> yeah. Kitchen Table Theologian, we have covered some of these in previous podcasts. We did an entire podcast on justification. It was episode number 54. We did a five podcast series on the Holy Spirit, which was episodes 42 through 46. One on salvation, episode 50. And we learned about the doctrine of the Reformation in episode number 112. That one is titled The Five Solas of the Reformation. So you guys can go back and listen to any one of those if you want to dive deeper into justification. So we discussed justification, a big theme running really throughout the entire letter that Paul wrote to the Romans. The second major theme, you mentioned it, but go ahead and tell us a little bit about that theme. Yeah, I think this one even rests on justification. And Paul redefines who the people of God are. God's chosen ones, Paul is teaching throughout the letter, are no longer, once the cross, once the resurrection has occurred, God's chosen people are no longer described as those who have a certain family line or those who have submitted to certain or specific religious rituals, but as those who have placed their faith in Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone. And even a casual reading of the letter to the Romans demonstrates that the church in Rome, you find out pretty quick, it was a mixed community of both Jews and Gentile. Paul's declaration is that there is no difference now between Jews and Gentiles as far as they're standing before God. All who believe in Jesus, Paul reiterates, are children of Abraham. They are recipients of God's blessing. And that was pretty earth-shattering news to Paul's original readers, many of whom were Jewish. That is so interesting. So how about we take these two themes, justification and Paul's goal to redefine who the people of God are, and you summarize the book for us before we go. The, yeah, all of Romans in three minutes, go. I'll, I'll just summarize the, the whole book. That shouldn't be a problem. Uh, no, you got I'll, it. Uh, I'll say... I'll preface it with this. In the summer of 2022, when I sat down to lay out how I was going to preach through Romans verse by verse, I saw that the book falls 
pretty naturally into four sections or divisions. And that's how I've preached it. So real quick, because I don't want this to get, as you're listening, kitchen table theologian, I don't want this to, your head to start swirling here, just trying to keep it on the surface. And of course, you're an intelligent person. You can read more, study more on your own. But that first section runs from chapter two to chapter three around verse 20. And that's all about why we need God's salvation. And we learn about God's wrath, his judgment against sin, and all that's directed against sinful human beings who deliberately go against God, suppress what even creation teaches us. And Paul puts the microscope on all of us, and we all fall short of God's holy demands. And so Jew and Gentile alike, we're under, all under the power of sin. But then God did something about that lost condition, which Paul describes in this second section. And you could say that goes from chapter 3, verse 21, all the way up through the end of chapter 8. So in, into this darkness of human sin, the light of the gospel pierces through. And because of the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross, God the Father can remain perfectly just. And at the same time, declare to be in a right relationship with them, those who believe in Jesus. And Paul goes on to affirm in that section the great blessings enjoyed by God's people that, you know, we have peace with God, we're standing in His grace, we rejoice in the prospect of seeing and sharing in the glory of God one day in heaven for eternity, that we're united with Christ in His death and in His resurrection, He's given us new life. That even though we struggle at times to live like the new creatures we are, we still have confidence that God is at work in all things for our good and that nothing can separate us from the love of God. I think Romans 8 is one of the greatest chapters in the Bible. And I've heard you say that it really acts as the keystone, I believe, for the entire letter. And Romans 8 is what you have been preaching on the last two or three weeks, I think. So Kitchen Table Theology, you can always visit bookcountrycc.org and go back and watch those past sermons if you want to dig into that. But Romans 8 is where we are right now in the sermon series as you're working through it. So didn't mean to interrupt you there. I just love Romans 8. Continue with your third division. <laughs> yeah, or if you're having trouble sleeping at night, go back and put the <laughs> sermons on and it'll knock you right out. No. They're great cures for insomnia. The third division of Romans, chapters 9 through 11, and really, they seem out of place because you're just cruising in Romans 8, and it's all this great, incredible, excellent stuff. And then we get to chapters 9, 10, 11. Like, Wait, what? Why is he talking about this all of a sudden? But we need to remember that the Roman church was comprised of Gentiles and a lot of Jews. And I'm about to start preaching these chapters very soon, Lord willing, and they're difficult for the 21st century Christian to understand, not because they're too deep theologically, but because they focus so much on Israel. So some Christians wondered, the cross happens, Christ comes, and people be, begin to wonder, what happened to God's promises to Israel? Did all the covenants just cease to exist? What's going on here? How did non-Jews get in on God's program? And Paul tackles those issues to bring a sense of unity and peace to the church. And he reminds us the gospel is rooted in the Old Testament covenant, but through Jesus, God has kept his promise, one of his great covenantal promises, to bless all nations, not just the Jews. And he's done that through the gospel. And so this is where we learn in this section, Gentiles have been grafted into the nation of Israel, and God's love rests on Gentile believers just as much as on the Jewish believers and the nation of Israel through all those covenants. So therefore, he says, salvation is for everybody who believes. And very quickly, the last main section of Romans 12, Romans chapter 12 through 16, there's where we see a call to every Christian to live out the implications of the gospel. So you live it out in the church, toward our enemies, in society, toward ourselves. And then Paul closes with this greeting to individuals in Rome. I think we what we mentioned with Phoebe, the 28 people there. And then he signs off with this final burst of praise 
to God. I love how the early reformer Martin Luther put it in the preface to his Romans commentary. He says, This epistle is really the chief part of the New Testament and the very purest gospel, and is worthy not only that every Christian should know it word for word by heart, but occupy himself with it every day as the daily bread of the soul. It can never be read or pondered too much, and the more it is dealt with, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. Yeah, that's the preface to his commentary on Romans. And that's only a part of it. That's I read a challenge. it I read it again before we recorded this. And John Wesley, the great awakening preacher that we likely all heard of, John Wesley came to faith in Christ reading Luther's preface, these very words. Wow. So he wasn't even in the commentary yet. He was just in the introductory notes, and they're so powerfully written that he came to faith in Christ. But it, isn't that great? And th- those are Luther's words. In Paul's words, the gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. What a great book, Kitchen Table Theologian. Pick up your Bible today. If you haven't been doing it recently, start reading again Paul's letter to the Romans. That really is great and a great note to end on there. Kitchen Table Theologians, thank you so much for listening today to our podcast with Pastor Jeff. Remember, you can always check out our episode notes and find more information at jeffcranston.com. You can also email us anytime at pastorjess at lowcountrycc.org. As always, we want to thank our friends at Low Country Community Church here in Bluffton, South Carolina and our friends at Streamline Podcast, both for making this podcast possible. Join us next week. We'll be back with another episode, Lord willing. And until then, always remember that the real power of theology is not only knowing it, but applying it. Thanks for joining us at the table. See you next week.